Hello everyone, and welcome to another Cutrate Commander Precon Upgrade Guide, the series in which we take a look at Precon decks and bring them up to Cutrate standards. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at the Buckle Up Precon from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, which we'll be bringing up from its $30 price point to the typical $65 of our Cutrate Commander builds. Before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I continue to work on more of these builds. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. The face commander of the Buckle Up Precon is Katori Pilot Prodigy, a 2-4 Moonfolk pilot that costs 1, a white and a blue, and has the following abilities. Vehicles you control have Crew 2. At the beginning of combat on your turn, target artifact creature you control gains lifelink and vigilance until end of turn. Breaking down her core stats, we can see that Katori is sporting a fairly low CMC, a defensive stat block for her cost, and a pair of abilities that focus on making our vehicles much easier to pilot for everyone, and adding some solid keywords to them when they're brought online as well as to any other artifact creatures we happen to be running. Looking more in-depth into her first ability, it quite simply enables us to use less of our creatures in order to bring our vehicles to bear, working particularly well with vehicles with low mana costs but high crew costs to get them down early and begin swinging in with them much sooner than we would otherwise be able to. But this isn't just for offense, as lower crew costs means we'll have more creatures untapped on our opponent's turns to crew our vehicles defensively as blockers, giving us the option to swing in and still have defensive options for the crackback instead of having to commit to one over the other. Her second ability then works very well with her first, giving the biggest artifact creature on our board, usually a vehicle, the means to pad our life totals and remain untapped during our opponent's turns to serve as a blocker, making it much more difficult to be attacked efficiently and enabling us to take even more hits if damage is able to bypass our squadron of vehicles. So, in keeping with Katori's vehicle-centric game plan, this upgrade will aim to improve what Katori's already good at, which is getting our vehicles online fast and using them to slam into our opponents. Luckily for us, the core build already has quite a few solid vehicle entries to make our job easier, but we'll be adding even more to ensure that there's always something for Katori and her squad to pilot. Speaking of her squad, while Katori is quite the accomplished pilot, she's still only one creature, so we'll be needing a supporting cast of pilots to get our vehicles into the air quickly and make them stronger and more effective as they do so, as well as having an efficient pit crew to ensure we always have mecha on hand for our pilots to ride, as well as getting us value out of them as they're brought into play or get into combat. So let's scramble the mecha as Katori and her squadron are eager to take the fight to our opponents. Possessing the best technology that the Futurist Vehicular Exploration Program has to offer, and with their leader piloting the state-of-the-art Kami-infused Epoch Engine Shurikai, this elite squadron of dogfighters is more than capable of handling any mission that comes their way, and crushing any and all who aim to do harm to both the people and the spirits of Kamigawa. So now that we have a better understanding of the commander and the game plan, let's take a look at the cards we'll be keeping from the base build of the Precon. Starting with our artifacts, we'll be keeping all the powerful vehicles that come in the base build, and they certainly don't come more powerful than Shurikai Genesis Engine. Possessing a mid-size CMC and a huge stat block and crew cost to match, just like in the lore, this mecha is perfect for our commander to enable, allowing us to cheat on its massive crew cost to put its enormous stat block to use on both offense and defense, in addition to getting us card advantage and more pilots on the field to crew our other vehicles turn after turn. Vehicles that bring other vehicles online also make the cut, such as Mobilizer Mech and Peacewalker Colossus, both of which help us crew our vehicles if we find ourselves short on pilots. The suite of flying vehicles consisting of Smuggler's Copter, Weatherlight, Aerial Surveyor, and Sky Sovereign Console Flagship also make it in, each giving us the means to get over blockers, as well as providing us with some decent utility in the form of card selection, card advantage, ramp, and removal, respectively. Parhelion 2 then joins the list of evasive vehicles, it being the most mana-intensive vehicle we're running, but its decent stat block, whole slew of keywords, and ability to dump 8-8 worth of stats on the field per swing, making it well worth the cost. The trio of Colossal Plow, Cultivator's Caravan, and Raider's Carve also keep their spots by being decent sources of ramp that fit our game plan, getting us the mana we need to get our bigger vehicles, pilots, and payoffs into play that much faster. Then we close out our vehicle suite with some utilitarian entrance in the form of Imperial Recovery Unit, whose mini Sun Titan-like effect lets us get our smaller creatures and vehicles back from the bin, Prodigy's Prototype, which gives us a steady stream of pilots to help crew our vehicles even if our commander's dealt with, Surge Hacker Mech, who serves as a solid removal tool on ETB and leaves behind a sturdy evasive stat block to use afterwards, and finally Imposter Mech, which gives us the opportunity to snag a copy of the most powerful creature on the board to swing in with, or just keep in the back row to make use of any passive or activated abilities it may have. Then we close out our artifacts with our collection of mana rocks, those being Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, Azoria Signet, and Felwar Stone, all of which make the cut by being very cheap sources of mana to drop early and help speed up our mana base. Moving on to our creatures, we'll be aiming to keep those that can help enable our vehicles and other artifacts the most. 
Ethereum Sculptor and Foundry Inspector, for example, are good forms of ramp to make all our vehicles and other artifacts one cheaper, while Solemn Simulacrum gives us a more traditional land-based ramp that replaces itself once removed, and can hop into a mecha alongside our commander while it sticks around. Creatures that power up our vehicles also get to keep their spots, such as Master of Ethereum, who pumps all our vehicles and other artifacts with his anthem, and gets bigger and bigger the more we have in play to make it a very good pilot or offensive powerhouse, and Katsumasa the Animator, who passively grows our uncrewed vehicles turn after turn, and can bring them online without the need to crew them while granting them evasion to boot. Speaking of evasion, some AoE means of granting our creatures flying in the main build will also keep their slots, with Aeronaut Admiral being a straightforward means of granting it to all our vehicles, while Cyber Drive Awakener makes all our artifacts evasive and turns all our non-creature artifacts into 4-4s until end of turn, enabling devastating alpha strikes out of nowhere by weaponizing our mana rocks, uncrewed vehicles, and other miscellaneous artifacts. The included draw sources of Shram Senior Edificer and Research Thief will also get to stay in, each providing the build with a steady stream of card advantage as we cast our vehicle spells or get them in for damage respectively. Finally, our last creature held over from the core build will be Shimmer Mirror, whose ability to flash in and in turn give all our artifacts flash, making it a superb way to get out surprise vehicles or artifact creatures to crew said vehicles on our opponent's turns. Now moving on to our instance, the removal spells of Dispatch, Swords to Plowshares, Reality Shift, and Generous Gift will be the four entrants we'll be keeping, as they all provide very cheap and efficient removal to deal with a good variety of threats on our opponent's turns. Then looking at our sorceries, we'll only be carrying over two, those being Thought Cast for the potential one mana draw two once we have enough artifacts on board, and Organic Extinction, which can be a very cheap wipe if we have the artifacts in play to help cast it, and leaves behind our vehicles and non-flesh and blood pilots on board after the dust settles, while hopefully reducing our opponent's creature bases to dust. Our enchantment slot then sees both enchantments from the base build keep their spots, with Swift Reconfiguration being a cheap flash speed removal option that's cumbersome for our opponents to interact with, and Thopter Spy Network giving us another source of card advantage as our vehicles and other artifacts crack in for damage, while providing us a steady stream of Thopters to help screen attacks, pilot vehicles, or be used as resources by some of our upgrades. Skipping our Planeswalkers, since we'll not be keeping any from the core build, our land-based carryovers will consist of Command Tower, Port Town, Prairie Stream, Skycloud Expanse, Spire of Industry, and Temple of Enlightenment, all of which give us some good access to all our colors, and finally 10 planes and 12 islands to round out our land base. That leaves us with a final tally of 66 cards, including basic lands we'll be keeping from the base build, leaving us with 34 cards to replace, giving us a good number of open slots to help optimize the build. But before we move on to upgrades, let's briefly go over some of the core cards we're swapping out and why. Starting with our creature cuts, the mana dorks of Goldmere, Silvermere, and Vidalcan Engineer were all let go since we already have a lot of ramp in the base build, and the one piece we'll be adding will be able to pilot a vehicle on its own alongside our commander unlike these. Mir Smith and Riddlesmith both get the axe as well, as while their artifact creation and looting effects are useful, they ultimately don't do enough in the build to warrant their inclusion. The same goes for Arcanist Sowl, whose dig effect is nice but was ultimately replaced by a more precise form of tutoring up our artifacts. The Thopter-focused entrance of Whirler Rogue and Psymaster Thopterist also lose their spots, as this build really doesn't produce the critical mass of artifacts on board needed to make the most out of their unblockability granting and their sack-to-draw effects, ultimately making them feel flat when drawn into or not doing enough when they're on board. Teshar Ancestor's Apostle, Hana Ship's Navigator, and Emery Lurker of the Lock all fail to make the cut as well, as while each of them is a potent source of recursion and reanimation, our build has no way to enable them apart from waiting for our opponents to remove our stuff, so they end up being better suited for builds that can set up the graveyard themselves to enable their effects. Quickly running down some of the older cards that didn't quite make it past tryouts. Indomitable Archangel, while providing some decent protection in the form of Shroud, is actually a non-bow with our commander as it prevents her from targeting our vehicles with her effect to grant them lifelink and vigilance. Cataclysmic Gear Hulk does too much damage to ourselves as we can't afford to lose the vast majority of our vehicles to wipe the board. And Raf Capish and Ship's Mage, while being an additional source of flash for our artifacts, just lost a spot by being a tad bit too much mana-wise for my taste, but it's still a very solid card and can easily be swapped back in by replacing one of our upgrades. Finally closing out this slot with the brand new creatures we cut from this build. Iron Soul Enforcer fails to make it in, since we'll never be attacking alone with our commander or it over our vehicles. Drum Bellower, while being a superb card in creature heavy builds, doesn't do enough in this one as our vehicles don't get untapped with its effect, and Kappa Cannoneer will find a much better home in builds like Thopters or Artifact Tokens, in which it can get very huge very quickly to one-shot the opposition, which this build is unable to enable efficiently. Moving on to our instant cuts, Crush Contraband failed to make the grade due to being a bit too mana intensive for the effect, as did Access Denied which is again too mana hungry and would be better suited for builds that can make use of the tokens it creates. 
Then we close out the cuts in this category with Release to Memory, whose Spirit Token creation doesn't really feel like it works in this build, and would be better suited for more token or spirit focus strategies, and Armed and Armored, which on paper seems like a good idea to animate all our vehicles for a turn, but in practice we'll usually have plenty of creatures to pilot said vehicles, leaving it taking up space in our hands for nothing. Quickly running down our sorcery exclusions, Dance of the Mance is a superb mass reanimation spell for our artifacts, but with no consistent way to enable it ourselves, it fails to make enough impact, and Universal Surveillance would find a better home in a deck with a more critical mass of artifacts to make the most out of its improvise and reload players' hands more efficiently. Our only artifact cut is then up next with Mirage Mirror, which one would think would be a great way to double up on our vehicles, but in practice doesn't do anything if we don't have the vehicles to copy, which ultimately got it cut to make room for more vehicles. The only Planeswalker in the base build, Jace Architect of Thought, also got the axe, as it only really serves as a source of card advantage that doesn't really fit in the deck's game plan, resulting in us swapping it out for a much more artifact-slash-vehicle-focused walker. As for our lands, Exotic Orchard gets cut in favor of some better options that are more in line with our artifact playstyle, as are five planes and three islands which we'll be swapping out for some additional dual and utility lands. So now that we've covered all the cuts we're going to be making from the core build, let's look at the cards we're going to be replacing them with in the upgrades. Looking at our artifacts first, we'll be adding a number of vehicles to our hangar to maximize the chance of us hitting them throughout the course of the game. Starting with some of our evasive additions, we have Heart of Kirin and Mindlink Mech, both of which have flying to more easily get in for damage, the former's vigilance enabling it to stay up to block without using our commander's ability, and the latter allowing us to double up on some very potent abilities if we have the right creatures crew it. Demolition Stomper then slots in as another evasive vehicle, its ability to bypass smaller creatures making it difficult for our opponents to jump block it properly, and more easily allowing it to crash its 10-7 stat block into important creatures or face, either of which are good for us. A pair of value-focused vehicles then join us with the Reckoner Bankbuster and Conqueror's Galleon, both of which generate card advantage for us, the former drawing us three cards over the course of its lifetime, then throwing in some ramp and a pilot to crew it as a bonus, while the latter turns into a land the first time it swings in to give us a potent suite of card selection, card advantage, and recursion tools to help us get additional resources throughout the course of the game. And finally, Consulate Dreadnought is our final vehicle addition. It's low CMC, massive stat block, and otherwise huge crew cost that is entirely eliminated by our commander's ability, making it the perfect addition to the build that hits the ground early and starts cracking in immediately for massive damage. Or at least it would be our final vehicle if we didn't have Cosima God of the Voyage as our first creature addition, whose back face, the Omen Keel, is our very last vehicle, giving us another cheap vehicle that can help us make our land drops by milling them from our opponents, while her front face is a slow but effective source of card advantage so long as we keep making our land drops. So with vehicles well and truly covered, our sights now turn to some more pilots to help crew them, starting with Hotshot Mechanic, whose 4 power while crewing allows him to crew most of our vehicles even without our commander's assistance, and the fact that he's an artifact also making him useful to enable our artifact payoffs. Katsune Ace and Gearshift Ace then both join our squadron as means to make our vehicles even more deadly in combat by granting them first strike, the former being able to grant it to all our vehicles as they swing in, and the latter granting it to whatever vehicle it crews to be used both on offense and defense. Some additional means to make our vehicles even bigger then get slotted in, starting with Chief of the Foundry, whose static plus one plus one boost to all our artifacts is good for powering up our vehicles and other artifact creatures alike, and Steel Overseer, who's a bit slower to come online but once he gets rolling can provide all our crude vehicles and artifact creatures, including itself, a steady stream of plus one plus one counters turn after turn. Then wrapping up our new artifact creature entries, we have Joyra's Familiar, which gives us another source of artifact cost reduction that's evasive and capable of crewing our vehicles, and Bronze Guardian, whose AoE Ward 2 for all our artifacts makes it that much more difficult for them to be picked off with removal, while its combination of power that scales with our artifacts and Double Strike making it a force to be reckoned with in its own right. Then we close out our creature upgrades with some non-mechanical entries, starting with La Shield Clockwork Scholar, who protects our vehicles from damage as they swing in so they can attack with impunity while drawing us cards on occasion thanks to our artifact creatures, Padim Console of Innovation, which gives us card advantage turn after turn thanks to our artifacts and giving them some solid protection in the form of his AoE Hexproof, Badalkin Archmage, who gives us even more card draw as we cast our artifact spells to help keep our hands nice and full, and finally Deadeye Quartermaster, who lets us tutor up a vehicle of our choice from our deck to ensure that our pilots have their pick of mech to ride into battle. Moving on to our new instant upgrades, we'll be adding a suite of spell disruption sources in the form of Counter Spell, Arcane Denial, and Disruption Protocol, all of which serve as cheap means to screen against effects that would otherwise remove our vehicles or disrupt our game plan. War of Invention then closes out our instant upgrades, which gives us the means to tutor up any vehicle we want from our deck directly into play on our opponent's turns, and even allows our other artifacts to help pay for it, which goes a long way to adding to this deck's consistency. 
Speaking of consistency, our new sorceries will bring us another pair of tutors in the form of reshape and anchor to reality, giving us even more ways to bring our vehicles directly into play from our deck instead of hoping we draw into them. Then we add Austere Command as our last sorcery upgrade, giving us a staple wipe whose modular nature enables us to dodge our pilots and vehicles while wiping everyone else's threats off the table. Moving on to our new walkers, we'll be adding Tezzeret, Betrayer of Flesh, to the build, whose passive works nicely to give a discount to all our vehicle's activated abilities, while throwing in some decent card advantage, permanent vehicle animation, and an ult that, if reached, will ensure that our hands will never be empty for the remainder of the game so long as we have artifacts. Finally, covering our Landslot upgrades, we'll be adding a suite of artifact lands consisting of Ancient Den, Seed of Synod, Darksteel Citadel, and Razor Tide Bridge to serve as additional artifacts for our artifact payoffs to take advantage of, Nimbus Maze to serve as another dual-colored land to help fix our colors, Mech Hanger to help fix our mana for our pilots and vehicles while helping us crew those vehicles later, Buried Ruin to help us recur any vehicles that may have been destroyed, and finally Scavenger Grounds to give our deck an easily accessible form of graveyard hate to help contend with any graveyard-focused builds we may encounter. So now that we've covered all the upgrades we'll be adding to the base build, let's take a look at the breakdown for this pre-con upgrade. This deck currently has 23 creatures including the commander, 8 instants, 5 sorceries, 2 enchantments, 25 artifacts, 1 planeswalker, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 22 vehicles, 15 cards that care about vehicles, 42 cards that are considered artifacts, and 22 cards that care about artifacts, leaving us with a large amount of vehicles to get maximum benefit from our commander's abilities, alongside other types of artifacts and payoffs for both, to ensure that they perform with maximum efficiency while we get maximum value. For general deck stats, we have 12 ramp sources, 13 card draw sources, 10 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes giving us a fairly typical ratio of core stats with no real outliers. Looking at our mana curve, we have 6 1-drops, 19 2-drops, 16 3-drops, 14 4-drops, 4 5-drops, 3 6-drops, and 2 7-plus-drops, giving us a light to mid-weight curve that aims to get our vehicles out quickly, then our commander alongside other pilots to get them online and begin dogfighting our opponents as soon as possible, crushing our opponents under their treads as we gain value from our payoffs so we don't run out of gas. The final price of the deck then comes out to be $64.52 after upgrades. This price is not including tax and assumes the price you paid for the pre-con was $30. The price of the cards was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For further upgrades, Fabricate is another great tutor effect to help us get our vehicles directly into our hand instead of hoping to draw into them, while Arkham Daxum is a bit slower but does let us cheat them directly into play at the low cost of sacrificing another artifact. Academy Ruins is a fantastic piece of recursion from the Landslot to keep pulling our artifacts from our bin again and again, and Tezzeret Artifice Master gives us another artifact source of draw and an ult that gets us a vehicle into play from our deck every turn if we're lucky enough to get to it. Finally, Enlightened Tutor gives us a very efficient means to fetch up any artifact we may need right to the top of our deck, but we'll need to be able to pay this tutor's fee as this upgrade alone costs as much as all our other upgrades combined. I guess that's the cost of a higher education. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. With the Buckle Up Precon covered, we'll be moving on to the Upgrades Unleashed Precon Upgrade Guide next, so look forward to a modified creature-focused build next week. Now taking a look at this week's poll, after reading through your suggestions in the previous video, the first line of contestants will be the X Spell Slinger Hinata Dawn Crown, the all-in value piece that is the Reality Chip, and the Ninjutsu Master Satoru Umezawa. Please cast your vote in the community tab, link in the description, and let me know in the comments who you voted for and which new commanders from Neon Dynasty you're most excited about and want me to build a deck around. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.